Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Margaret Tennant, and I'd like to welcome you to our panel presentation on some aspects of how technology affects psychology, the brain, the body, and the heart and the mind. Um, and so um, we're going to have three speakers today talking about three different topics. And the format for today is that each of the speakers will be talking for 10 minutes. And then after that, we'll open it up to questions. And first, let me ask you, can you all hear me OK? Excellent, good. Um, and the second thing is there is a sign-in sheet circulating. Uh, some of you are getting extra credit, and depending on your class, need to sign that uh, sheet. So be sure and do that. So um, we're going to start with my colleague, Nadia Monasov, and she's going to be talking about multitasking. Hi, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good. Anyone multitasking right now? <laughs> so let's, let's talk a little bit about whether it's actually something that you should be doing or not. So here is my lecture. Here is the name of my talk. Right? And the first thing I want you guys to notice is there is a couple of uh, messages in there. Right? And in order for you to read that message, how are you actually doing it? How are you getting the information? Yeah. Right? So you're taking it we, uh, a sentence at a time, and ultimately. Right? And so that's really what you're doing when you're actually multitasking. So the first thing I'm going to do is give you a little bit of information, give you some data, give you some research. And then um, I'm going to end today with a little um, activity where you, get, you could figure out yourself whether you're actually good at this or not. So let's take a look. So defining multitasking. So there's a couple of ways, there's a couple of definitions that we have for this. And so multitasking includes any time you're actually performing two or more activities, right? And how many of you have done this before? <laughs> right? I think all hands should be up at this point. Um, also, switching from one task to another quickly, right? So maybe it's you checking the email, and while you're checking the email, you're also texting your friend, right? How many of you, I see a lot of students in here, so how many of you are actually, you know, be honest, sitting in class and maybe underneath the seat checking your phone as well? Right? So that's the same thing. That's what you're doing. And then the last but not least is uh, performing two or more tasks in rapid succession of each other. Right? So that's ultimately when we're talking about multitasking, that is what we're talking about. So continuing on. So generation wired. Right? That's sort of where we are right now. So much technology. There's more media being used by the average person today than there was before. And so what we have now is that young people are using a lot more uh, multitasking techniques than ever before, right? That's a given. Um, on this chart, um, you can see exactly what activities are paired with what. So 86% of individuals are using their smartphone while performing all of those other activities, right? I don't know about you, but that number is staggering. It's pretty crazy. So are we getting better at multitasking, right? The idea here is the more you do it, maybe the better you become, right? And what do you guys think? No. <laughs> How many of you say no? How many of you personally think you're an excellent multitasker? All right, OK. So here is what we have when we're talking about multitasking. So a little bit of background information. So our attention works sort of like a spotlight, right? So what we focus on is seen, you know, think of the spotlight. Whatever the spotlight is shining on, that's what we pick up, right? What happens when, you know, to the area where the spotlight is not shining onto? Can you see it? What do you guys, can you see, can you see where the spotlight is not shining? No, right? But you can certainly pick up that information peripherally, right? But it's not as bright as obviously the, the light. So here, Ultimately, our attention is just like that spotlight, right? So our attention has very limited capacity. And even when you multitask, naturally, evolutionarily, evolutionarily, we can't actually change the way our brain works. So frequent multitasking does not actually increase the <coughs> limits of our brain. And so the more stimuli you have, the less attention you're actually using, right? And so that's what we're looking at. And so I 
thought this chart was actually kind of eye-opening for me. So this is for those of you who actually like to multitask, who like to do multiple projects at the same time. Um, this is looking at how much time you're dedicating to working per project if you're working on multiple projects at the same time. So if you're working on one project, 100% of your time is dedicated to that project. That makes sense, right? Now, what happens when you're working on two projects simultaneously? So ultimately, that 100% of our time is divided by each project gets about 40%, and then there's a 20% um, gap between task changing, task switching, right? So in order for you to switch between tasks, there is a lot of energy wasted. And look at what happens when we go into you know, working on three projects simultaneously. What do you guys see there? Who's a good graph interpreter? More focused on what you're switching to. Yeah, your more, more attention is being paid to, to what you're actually switching to, rather than the task at hand. And obviously, look at five, look at four, it gets worse as we go on, right? So the idea here is you're actually unable to do as much work when you're working on five projects simultaneously. Um, so multitasking on the brain. So here is a quick example on just two tasks and what they look like when we're focusing on them independently versus combined, right? So here we're looking at language comprehension. So this person is uh, performing some language comprehension task, and you see some activity going on in the brain. Um, here we have an object rotation task. And again, um, the focus here should be where is the activity as well as how much activity by looking at the little blue dots, right? Do you guys see that? Here, we have combined um, activity, right? So these individuals are actually doing language comprehension with an object rotation text, test simultaneously. And obviously, as you can see by the blue dots, there's not as much activity. So that's exactly what's happening in your brain when you're trying to multitask, right? So are you able to do it? Sure, but you're just not spending as much, you know, you're not giving as much attention to it. Your brain is not working the way it usually will if it's only focusing on one task in particular, all right? So effects of multitasking. So these are kind of fun to look at. So what we notice in research is that those individuals who multitask um, have a decreased um, produ productivity, right? We notice this at school, we notice this in the workplace, um, you know, really everywhere. And it could be up to about 40%, which if you think about it, that's a lot. Um, research has shown that we lose about $650 billion of dollars worth of productivity because, you know, people at work are taking little breaks or reading emails in the time that they're supposed to be reading. So that's a significant amount of, you know, loss occurring. Um, increased stress, right? Which is all, we all know that stress isn't good for you. We want to actually work on decreasing it. Inhibition of creative abilities. Because again, you're spending so much time switching that you're unable to actually focus and get creative toward, any, you know, toward the subject. Um, here's an interesting one right, that students will be concerned about. When you are multitasking, right, if you're performing two or more activities at the same time, your IQ actually drops for that moment, not permanently, right, for that moment, um, 10 points. And if you think about it, that's kind of a big deal. Right? Um, also, research has shown that those individuals who tend to multitask all the time actually are unable to filter irrelevant information. What do you guys think of that? Right? So the idea is, you know, every day we come across tons of information and we have to filter through it to figure out what's important and what isn't. Right? Those individuals who are high multitaskers and those individuals who think they're good at multitasking are actually worse at filtering that irrelevant information. So they're taking everything in and believing it at face value, ultimately. And so for students, I think this is the fun one to look at, right, is multitasking also obviously impairs individuals academically. So academic impairment. Assignments will obviously take you longer to complete, right? You're going to make more mistakes. You're also going to learn things spottier, sh more shallow. Right? You're not going to be able to learn for content, learn for understanding. Um, you're going to have impaired memory. And believe it or not, research also shows that there is a negative impact on GPA as well. No surprise there, hopefully. Right? Um, so let's see. Let me make sure we're on task. All right. So is multitasking ever OK? Yes. When? 
when it's not dangerous, okay? So here's the thing. People multitask all the time, right? In fact, look at me right now. I'm trying to walk around. I'm lecturing. I'm looking at my PowerPoint. I got a microphone. I got this little clicker, right? So the idea is there are times when it's okay to multitask. One of those times is when you are performing two familiar tasks, walking and talking, walking and listening to the radio, easy, right? When it's not okay, and here's a couple of examples, right? You could dance and clean at the same time. Um, you could watch TV and eat at the same time. I don't think anyone's going to be hurt by that. Um, running while listening to your iPad, right, iPod. Um, however, what you shouldn't be doing is completing one task that requires a lot of focus and requires a lot of attention and, you know, doing something that you're familiar with. Because ultimately what's going to happen is that task that requires the focus, you're not going to do very well on, right? That's where all those effects are going to come in. And so examples, you've heard it before, texting and driving, right? Another one is obviously when you're doing homework, right, or preparing for a test, you probably shouldn't be using any form of media, all right? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to end this today with a little activity in case you don't believe me and you want to see how good you are at multitasking, all right? So what you need to do, you do need to um, have a piece of paper for this. So grab a sheet of paper, um, see if you have kind of a whole sheet or a half sheet. And this is a timed activity, as you can see. I'll start the timer soon. Yeah. Sorry? I don't need it. No, nope, it's just for you. So really quickly, what we're going to do is I'm going to start the timer. And in that time, what you're going to do is you're going to write can multitasking make you a better student? And as soon as you're done with that, you're going to number your paper 1 through 37, or write out 1 through 37. Easy? Yes? So can, and again, I'll keep that up there. The timer is going to go. Make sure when you're done, you pay attention to the time and you write down that time. All right? So can multitasking make you a better student? And then 1 through 37. Are you guys ready? Here we go. Make sure you note your time when you are done. It's going to be, that's where you're going to see if anything happens. So for the next trial, um, you're going to do something similar but different. You're actually going to do a switch task. So instead of writing out the whole, um, you know, can multitasking make you a better student and then numbering your paper 1 through 37, you're going to alternate, right? So you're going to write C1, A2, and I give you guys a couple of examples. So you're going to basically write a letter, write a number, write a letter, write a number, and there's 37 letters, so at the end you will actually get to the end. All right, and again, I'm going to start the timer, and let's see if you get the same amount of time, if you complete it as quickly. You guys ready? Here we go. I see many people are still working, and we are actually out of time, right? So really quickly, show of hands, how many of you took a lot longer on the second trial? 
right? That is what happens when you are trying to multitask. Right, so now you know. So ultimately, really quickly, I'm going to leave you on a positive note, obviously. I'm not going to just drop you here. That would be mean, <laughs> right? But is there hope? So my suggestion to you, and it's pretty straightforward. I think you guys can get this on your own. Eliminate any and all distractions that you possibly can, even if it's only for, you know, 15 minutes, right? Study for 15 minutes. Take a two-minute break. Study again after that, right, if you need to. Um, also, focus on one item at a time. And that will genuinely really improve whatever it is that you're actually working on. And so I leave you with this quote, um, which I think is quite fabulous. To do two things at once is to do neither. And that really ultimately is exactly what multitasking is about. All right? Thank you. So now our next speaker is going to be Margaret Tennant, and she will talk to you about her topic. Hi again. So folks, I'm going to talk to you about video games. And I bet none of you play video games, right? <laughs> How many of you play video games? So would it surprise, not that many hands went up. Say that again, be honest. How many of you play video games? OK, maybe more. Would it surprise you to know that somewhere between uh, 91 all the way up to 99% of students, US teens, um, play video games? Would that surprise you? No, not really? Yeah, absolutely. Because that's several studies have estimated that amount. And uh, video games themselves have generated over $25 billion in revenue in 2010 alone. That's over double uh, what um, box office sales of movies actually have generated. Now, another thing that might not surprise you is that our human brain is plastic. And most of you are psychology students, so I think you know this. But that means then that anything that we perceive or that we do or that we experience in the environment can actually change our brain. So psychologists are wondering, with everybody spending all this time on video games, what's going on with our brain? Um, are we getting better at some things? Or, as some are afraid of, are we getting worse? In other words, are video games doing terrible things to our brain um, because we should be, de be doing more productive things overall uh, that we used to do before the advent of video games? Now, a fair amount of research has looked at aggression, especially with violent video games, and I'm sure some of you have read some of this. Um, that, however, is going to be a topic for another uh, talk, not this one. Um, and I want to look today at maybe some positive things that are going on with video games. Because actually, a fair amount of research in the past few years is showing us that some pretty good things might be happening to our brains as a result of playing video games in as much or as little as an hour a day. Now, I want to give you folks first a full disclosure. I'm not a gamer. I don't know if you're surprised about that or not, but I'm not a gamer. Um, but after, after reading the research, I think I want to start. So I'm looking for suggestions, you guys. Okay, so if you have any good games you think might be good to start, let me know. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, what kind of games? Those of you who are gamers um, know that. Well, you know, most of you know this. There's a million different kinds of games. I mean, there's... Uh, First person uh, shooter games like this, Black Ops, uh, what is this, Black Ops 2 and Medal of Honor. And, um, I, you know, obviously I got these from somewhere because I haven't played these games myself. Um, there's puzzle games like Portal. Uh, there's world building games like Minecraft, very popular game. All these were the top games of the past year or so. Um, but of course, there's also role playing games and strategy games and all different kinds of games. So do all those games that do different things have the same effect on our brains? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Surprisingly though, there is one thing that all these games have in common. And this is very important. Um, they're all involving interactive play. 
And resource, researchers have known for a long time that play is really important, um, especially to children, because it helps them practice role playing and, and, and mediate moods and, and channel aggression and even learn physical skills. Well, people are thinking now maybe some of those same things can actually be replicated in video games overall. But the really crucial part is about them, that they're fun and they're interactive. That means that what you do in the video game um, changes the game itself. And we're going to come back to that a little bit later because that's crucial in the effect overall in video games. So researchers have looked at video games and they've um, studied four, and they found four general domains that benefit our brains. First of all, in the cognitive domain, and that means kind of thought structures, um, how you think about things and how you focus on things. They found benefits emotionally as well in mood control. They found benefits in motivation. People tend to be more motivated in a really positive way after playing video games. And finally, oddly enough, maybe, I don't know, it may surprise you, that there's actually benefits in social interaction as well. So we're going to look at these kind of one at a time and uh, pull apart what some of these um, uh, benefits are to these games. So let's look at cognitive first. And um, this area has been studied the most. And so there's been a, it's easier to kind of look at um, what you're thinking about overall. So most of the study has been directed here. And surprisingly, most of the study has shown benefits in this kind of game. Now, these are the games that people kind of don't like always, because some of these are pretty violent, right? But, uh, but nonetheless, they've shown some surprising results for playing these action shooter games. First of all, um, they found that people who play these games are very good at um, focusing and their attention um, and allocating their attention, meaning that they're very able to kind of hone in on something and then um, uh, uh, get, away, get rid of all those irrelevant details that would distract them otherwise. Probably because, again, I'm not a gamer, but I think these games go really fast, right? Um, and so you've got to be looking, you've got to always be seeing these very rich visual environments and you're looking to see what's there and someone's going to get you any second. And so you're really developing these focusing skills. They've even done MRIs of brains of, of people who's played these games and found that neural processing is much faster on these, giving evidence of this ability, a very efficient kind of attention focusing. Um, they found that people actually get better in their eyesight. Their visual acuity improves. And so they're actually able to read lower on that eye chart. Um, finally, they found that spatial reasoning is better in ple people who play these kind of games. They can imagine, you know, talk about multitasking. These things are driving me crazy. They can imagine um, shape shifting and uh, mentally rearranging shapes kind of in your mind um, much more easily. Now, traditionally, that kind of spatial reasoning is much better in boys. And many tests will show this, that men uh, score as much as a standard deviation higher in that. But you know what? Girls who play those games end up evening it up and, play, and are just as good at this as boys are overall. So the video games actually help improve that. Um, but um, th these things are really important for a couple other reasons. All of these skills are directly correlated with and predict um, career success in the career fields that are the really hot, important fields for the 21st century. They're called the STEM fields. I don't know if you've heard of that before. But science, technology, engineering, and math. And those are the skills that are needed for those really important careers. So educators, as you can imagine, are really excited about this, thinking, wow, how can we incorporate this um, and get people really good at this using this kind of technology um, so that students can take advantage of this and improve those skills? Excuse me. Now, um, other kinds of games, almost all games do another couple things as well. Um, they, for example, they're very good at problem solving skills in general, probably because most video games don't come with directions. You kind of figure it out. And so you try, it's trial and error. Try something this way, then you do it again if it works or whatever. Um, and so you get very good at this kind of problem solving, strategizing type skill. Um, this, interestingly, uh, correlates with um, higher academic grades. Not clear if people who are good at this in video games, actually if you can transfer that skill 
over to the academic domain or not yet, but it does uh, correlate with that as well. Now, creativity, <coughs> excuse me, is also positively associated with video games. But this is another one of those kind of things that it's not clear if um, people who play video games tend to be creative more to begin with. And if they are, then that makes sense. It would be positively correlated. But it may be, though, that actually video games tend to enhance creativity. So all these cognitive skills um, are pretty robust. The research is pretty ro uh, robust on most of this. But that's not all, folks. Um, also, motivational skills. Now, if you play video games, you probably love video games, and no one has to talk you into doing it. Um, you're probably highly motivated to, to, be on, to begin with. Well, what researchers have found is that video games promote something called a growth mindset. And what that means is that you think that the better, the harder you work at something, the better you get. So as I put up here, practice makes perfect. Now, educators and psychologists love this because it means that if you think the harder you work at something, you better you get at it, you're going to do better in sports, and you're going to do better in school, and you're going to do better in just about any other domain because you're working harder to make it happen. So video games actually reward this um, because video games dynamically adjust whenever you play. You might start out not being very good, but then you work at it, and you practice it, and you get rewarded, you get better. And so the video game, it's interactive. And so you're right in that kind of sweet spot where you, you're not quite perfect yet, but you're working harder, and you get better, and then you score, and, and you get excited. And so then you want to do it some more. Um, and so again, this is actually a, a rewarding persistence, even in the face of frequent failure. Something that, again, educators want to know how to do this. How do we get this into educator games, edu educating games, to get students to transfer this to other fields then as well? Now, a lot of research hasn't been um, done yet to tell if this really does transfer. But they did find that in one study, um, uh, some um, uh, gamers did persist longer in kind of a boring task like you know anagram solving or something like that than non-gamers. So it may be it really does improve and increase persistence overall. So what about emotional <laughs> things? Well, we know that uh, video games help manage moods and emotional stress. Um, they generate positive feelings. They make you feel good overall. They give you a sense of personal control. And that's a bottom line of personal good um, well-being overall. And so many, this has actually been documented a lot in puzzle games in particular, including Angry Birds and um, Bejeweled 2. Anybody play Bejeweled? I hear that you do. I hear that is the hot game. And so maybe I'll start with that one. It's an easy one to start. Um, but definitely documented in that. Now, there's other positive things going on, too. And have you ever heard of the concept called flow? Have you ever heard of flow? Flow is this kind of <coughs> feeling that you get, a psychological concept that you get, that when you're involved in an experience, you get so immersed in the experience that you just lose all sense of self-consciousness. You just love what you're doing. Well, video gamers, this is what happens. And when you're involved in your video game, you enter into this state of flow overall. Now, flow has been studied a lot. And it has a lot of positive associations, especially in adolescence, uh, for things like helping self-esteem, lowering anxiety, and even helping um, more, them do better in school overall. So that's a really good thing emotionally about video games as well. Finally, um, what, oh, a couple other things, not finally. Um, negative things. We all know that video games don't, aren't always positive. Sometimes you get angry, you get frustrated, and things like that as well. But on the other hand, after you do that, right away, you might accomplish something, and then you get this high. So what's happening is you're ending up being able to manage that kind of negative emotional state. And it gives you a lot of emotional flexibility. And emotional flexibility is the opposite of something called rumination. And rumination is when you just think or think about something that's really depressing to you. And that's correlated with depression um, and other kinds of negative things. So emotional flexibility, like our video gamer right here who's just going through all these different states, this is a really important thing for keeping um, mental health overall. Um, so what about social skills? So socially, um, if any of you think, and I'm sure it, you folks are pretty savvy to this, 
But if any of you think that video games, a stereotypical video gamer, is a loner, well, that hasn't been happening for years. 70% of video game players do so with somebody else, either cooperatively or competitively overall. And um, lab research has shown, and here's a little lab study for you about poor little rats, that when baby rats do play fighting, it, reduces, it, it produces a little chemical in their brain that improves social skills. So, re so psychologists are thinking, hey, play fighting, isn't that what we do in video games? So that could be one reason why improved social skills tend to correlate with video games. So overall, what are some of the things that are included in that? Social decision making is one of them. Um, a lot of video games involving maybe uh, taking leadership, deciding who you're going to trust or not trust or things like that. And so making decisions quickly um, is enhanced um, socially in video game playing. Another one, surprisingly, is pro-social skills. Skills such as helping other people or cooperating or things like that. Um, this is shown in practically any kind of video game that involves cooperative play, even violent games. So violent games have their own body of research, but if they involve cooperatively, cooperatively playing with someone else, actually those that, it, that it causes you to have more pro-social skills outside of the game. This has been documented with kids, um, and now they're doing research now on older players in as well. Now here's one that might kind of stretch a little bit. Civic engagement. Can playing video games make you a better citizen? That's kind of counter to what we think about overall. But it turns out that actually there's some evidence of this. Because in video games, often people take leadership roles, or often they organize people uh, and, and things in, in the games themselves. And, um, and they're showing that this can, at least it correlates with doing the same things outside of the game itself. But again, it's not clear if that's because the people playing those kind of games tend to be oriented towards this to begin with. So basically, in conclusion, I just kind of gave you a rundown of all this kind of research that's out there, but there's just much more there, and I find it really exciting. Um, in fact, it's not just me. Educators and, and, and people in medicine and, and psychiatry are all trying to jump on this bandwagon and trying to find uses now for all this research to make these games out there so that we can use them and get the benefits from them to improve our brains. The big problem is, Remember what I said earlier. What did I say? What, is it? what do they have to be? What do games have to do? Remember from the very beginning? What do they have to do? Get to fun. And the problem is, a lot of educators um, and medicine people, they make the most boring games on the planet. And guess what? Um, you're going to play these games, and you're going to play them once and not do it again. So that's the challenge now of the future. Um, so stay tuned. The research is just beginning. If any of you folks are really into this research kind of stuff, just email me and I'll send this to you um, and give you any of these links, anything else you want to know um, about the latest research and videos. So thank you folks. And now you can send it. Hi everybody! Thank you for joining us. I'm gonna I'm gonna finish with something light. Um, how technology is changing our conception of death, um, and I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm gonna jump right in for the sake of time, and I'm gonna start with how do we know if someone is dead? Okay, so let's talk about history briefly. Um, I want my audience alive. Um, the historical point of view: we check vital signs. Uh, is there a heartbeat? Is, are they breathing? If not, this person would be considered dead. So how do we tend to determine death today if that was the historical point of view? Well, actually, even today, for the most part, this is exactly how we determine death. Um, there's, it's still determined in the same way. However, today, determining death can be more complex. Um, why? Why? I mean, you can kind of guess from the picture. 
Right, we have, exactly, advances in medical technology, which makes it more complex. So let me give you some examples of medical technology. Ventilators. Um, if you can't breathe for yourself, there are ventilators that can help you. Um, we have things like feeding tubes, so if you can't digest your own food, we can help you. Even things like antibiotics, which we tend to think of as sort of minimal, um, those things can help us to stay alive. Uh, and, and before I talk about how they, com they complicate things, I do want to mention that these things save lives. And oftentimes, they're amazing. But they can make things trickier. And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk discussing. OK, so I want you to close your eyes for a moment. And I'm going to have you imagine some scenarios. OK, does everybody have their eyes closed? It's story time. OK, We're in, you're in a hospital room. Blood is pumping through your veins. Your chest is rising and falling from the flow of air entering and exiting your lungs. However, all of these vital processes are being controlled by medical technology such as a ventilator. You will never be able to control these processes again without assistance because your brain stem has been irreversibly damaged. Though you are not in control of your body, you still maintain a pinkish color and are warm to the touch. Open your eyes for me. Would you consider yourself alive? Just raise your hand. OK, so good. I see some. I, I like controversy, OK? Um, would your loved ones consider you alive? OK. What about society? Would your family be ready to donate your organs? OK, let's go to scenario two. Close your eyes again. Due to a functioning brainstem, you can control your own breathing and heart rate. But in this case, your cerebral cortex is irre irreversibly damaged. Therefore, you have no conscious awareness of who you are, of what's going on in your body, or the world around you, and you never will again. Furthermore, you've lost the ability to digest food and will be dependent upon a feeding tube for the rest of your existence. Would you now consider, oh, open your eyes. <laughs> would you now consider yourself alive? Go ahead and raise your hand if you would. Okay. What about your loved ones? I see some differences. There might be some differences in how you see yourself and how your loved ones see you. Uh, what about society? Alive, okay. Would you think your family would be uh, ready to donate your organs? OK, so let's think about this. All right. Um, if you feel conflicted or disturbed by these scenarios, you're not alone. We have entire conferences, religious leaders gather to discuss these issues. Um, prior to medical advances, nature would have taken its course in those two scenarios. OK, um, those end of life decisions would have been out of our hands. We wouldn't have had to have decided at all. Um, so but with choice, as you all know, comes responsibility. And as a society, with these medical advances, we've had to look at things that maybe we don't want to, such as um, what constitutes death? How do we know when somebody is alive? Is there a point where we should stop intervening even though we still have the technology to do so? Okay. Now, people have spent their lives work on this. There is a bioethicist by the name of Robert Veach, and he has come up with one definition of death, and I'm going to talk about that briefly. Um, it's a complete change in the status of a living entity. Notice here, in order to die, you had to have been what? Alive. Okay characterized by the irreversible loss, meaning it has to be permanent, of those characteristics that are essentially significant to it. Oh boy, so what is so essentially significant about us that it constitutes life? Is this an easy question? No, okay. So there are different answers to this question, and I wanna look at three different approaches. So the first one is gonna be looking at an irreversible loss of the flow of vital fluids. Basically, what this, um, this approach is saying is, if we can pump our own blood, if we can uh, have oxygen going through our system, then we would be considered alive. 
But the catch is, it doesn't matter, according to this approach, how that's happening. It doesn't matter if you're doing it or a ventilator is doing it. You would be considered alive if your heart was pumping, if your lungs were contracting. Other people would say, uh-uh, that's not enough. And what this approach says is it's the irreversible loss of the capacity for bodily integration. That may not sound like English, so let me break it down for you. Um, basically, this, these people would say, you know what, if I can't pump my own blood, if I can't contract my own lungs so I can have oxygen going through my body, then I'm not alive. I need to know that my brain stem can do this for me. And other people would say, that's still not enough for me. I need to know that I have not permanently lost the ability for consciousness, for social interaction, to know who I am, to know who others are, and to be able to respond to my environment. In which case, even if their brain stem is working, they want to know that their higher brain functions are working. So if you are in a state, and this will come up later in the talk, talk where your brain stem is functioning, but your cerebral cortex is irreversibly damaged, we call that a permanent vegetative state. OK, so now come organ donation, late 1960s. We have these advances in medical technology. Um, and we start harvesting organs. And we don't have a clear definition of death. Do you think this could be problematic? Yeah, yeah uh, you took my you know, friend's heart, and I thought they were alive. There was a flurry of controversy over this. We need to be very clear on who's alive and who's dead. So. In the 1980s, which I think isn't that long ago, uh, a presidential committee came together to try to work this out. If we are going to be harvesting organs, we need to be very clear on what is dead and what is alive. So this is how, what they came to. And most states today have adopted some form of this. So an individual is considered dead if, one thing is, if they have irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions. Basically what that means is if they can't pump their blood, their oxygen, they would be considered dead. For most of us, for most of us, is that gonna be sufficient? Yes. But what if you have brain injuries and you are basically on life support? You have a ventilator, a heart-lung machine, a feeding tube. What they go to next is this. They look at irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem. So if you are on life-saving <coughs> technology and they can't tell if you are pumping your own blood and, and, and you never will again, what they do is they turn to your brain and they look for electri electrical activity in your brain. If that is irreversibly damaged, you are then considered brain dead. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Some of you may be familiar with this woman. Does anybody remember who that is? <coughs> Shivo. Shivo. Yeah, good. Terry Shivo. Yeah. Um, so we'll be talking briefly about her in a moment. Um, let's say. So what if, by the Uniform Determination of Death Act, you're considered alive? Are you? Are you? Are you stuck in this situation? Okay. Do you have any control? So, for example, Terry Shivo lived in a permanent vegetative state for 15 years. Um, friends and family reported that she did not want to live in that state, but she didn't write anything down. Okay. Um, does an individual has, have any control over the matter? Yes, they do. We have constitutional rights. Thank you, uh, founding fathers. Okay. We, as patients, have the right to refuse. Whether we're dying or not, I mean, this could be, no, I, thank you, I don't want that x-ray. Okay, but let's say you are, this becomes more significant in if you're in a life or death situation, I mean, if you're um, being um, kept alive by uh, medical technology. We have to, the right to refuse treatment. So let's say, for example, a doctor uh, tells somebody, you will not be alive if you're not on this ventilator. You will be on this ventilator for the rest of your life. Somebody could say, you know what, then I, I don't want it, and it doesn't matter if I'm not going to live, I'm going to refuse it. Or it could come to the fact of you could withdraw the treatment. So maybe the ventilator has started and you can say, or your loved ones could say, take them off. And if I die or if my loved one dies, so be it. I'm done. So we do have some control. Um, thankfully to these women here and their courageous families. This, is, this person's name is Karen Ann Quinlan. 
This is Nancy, Nancy Beth Cruzon. Um, these were young people when they actually had brain injuries. So for example, Karen Ann Quinlan um, used drugs um, and basically she slipped into a persistent vegetative state. Nancy Beth Cruzon in her 20s had a car accident, slipped into a permanent vegetative state. Their families fought for their right to refuse or withdraw treatment. So what if the patient is unable to communicate? Because as I said, in a, per, in a permanent vegetative state, you don't have any conscious awareness. So what happens? Well, you still have constitutional rights, thankfully. However, it requires forethought. Because you can't speak at that point. So you need to think about, when would I say no more? Even if my society would consider me alive, would I consider myself alive? There are things called advanced directives. And basically, you can give written instructions about what you would want if you become incapacitated, if you are not able to communicate your wishes. You can also um, name a health proxy. By the way, if you don't write down what you want and you become incapacitated, your next of kin makes those decisions for you. Do you trust your spouse? <laughs> Do you trust your mom? Do you trust your sister, okay? So if you feel that your next of kin is not the person you want making your end of life choices and you don't want to write it down for yourself or if you want to do something additionally, name somebody, okay? So take control of your humanity. Fill out an, an advanced directive. They're online. They are free. They don't require an attorney, but so, by the way, I made it very simple. You can Google Advanced Directive California. If you leave California, every state basically has their own forms. You would need to, you know, if you move to Arizona, get the Arizona form, so on and so forth. Um, I put a link here, although it's long and laborious. Um, in summary, technology can complicate matters of life and death, but it can empower you to take control over your humanity. But communication is a must. When you fill out those advanced directives, make sure you pass them out to everybody, like good playing cards, okay? Because if only one person has it, then it's not going to be as, um, it's legal, it's valid, it's signed, but you want people to know your wishes. Do you think this is an easy topic to talk to mom and dad about? No, and as you can see, often people who end up in these situations are young folks. Also, those who put up their own Christmas lights, I have heard there's a bump in organ donation. The ladders, watch the ladders, okay? Um, seriously, it's dangerous. <coughs> Pay someone. Okay, <laughs> communication is a must. Um, and I have a version of Go Fish called Go Wish. It is a card game that you can get, and I, darn it, well, it's, I don't have it accessible. Um, and basically, you can bring up these hard topics with people in a, more safe, in a safer way that's not so scary. I um, mean, I just got it online. If you put in Go Wish, you can order them. They're not that expensive. And then you can have these hard discussions. Thank you very much. I hope you take control. today in my 10 minutes was just to talk about the positive. Um, part of one issue is that I didn't really mention is that whole emotional piece. If you use it adaptively to manage things, that's good, but it can easily be used avoidantly to avoid other kinds of things as well. And the whole video addiction is, a whole, again, a whole other topic. You're absolutely right. There's other things there. As with anything, you know, there's going to be pros and cons on that as well. So that's a very good point. 
questions along similar lines. Um, now, I would assume you're comparing like the improvement in video games to not playing video games at all. How yeah. would that compare to outside activities? Is, would outside activities have just as much improvement? Or well, it, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really good researcher kind of question. Because what you'd have to look at, you'd have to kind of compare, what they're looking at in, in, in general is groups who've played a certain kind of games and groups who have not. But if you want to compare groups who've played a certain kind of game to some other activity, that would be then another very valid kind of research topic to do. And again, this is just getting started. You know, because video games haven't been this, you know, this, this uh, immersed in the culture for that long. But it's a very good question to ask. And I don't know, you know, overall what they've done. Yeah? What are the major um, kind of issues in advancing technology that we as a society see since technology is the most, the fastest evolving thing that we as humans have ever seen is this multiplicity of identity that is natural for humans now, that we separate technological identity and human identity. Ray Kurzweil, who is, when he talks about the six epochs of evolution, he says we already fit that ball, which is where technology, technology and biology are merging, but they are still separate, and that we are approaching the sixth epoch, which is when they become one. Do you think that when we be, they become one, that our identities of technology and biology will become one, or will they remain separate? You can address that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, you know what? That's an amazing question. And I think I'm going to answer it with two, two responses. One is, through evolution, our, cha our brain changes very slowly, much more slowly than our technology is changing. Now, if you read a book called Feed, which was a book that we assigned last year. Um, I mean, and and they, they talked about sticking sort of technology into our brains, making it a part. Google Glasses, I mean, are coming pretty close, right? Um, so that's, that's one of them. I, I don't see through evolution, and, and I might not be answering this exactly right, that, that evolution moves so much slower than technology. Um, so that our brains, I think, will have a hard time keeping up with how fast our technology goes. And then I'm trying to remember what the other response was. Um, because it was the other way. Maybe I'll think, does, do you want to add anything? Maybe I'll think of it. I, I just want, and, and again, I, I'm not sure that we're catching all of the question, because I haven't read a lot of Chris Well, but, um, but I do know, I have read a little bit about AI and so forth, and a lot of the predictions, a lot of what we fear that robots will become human, will be able to assume those things are really way, way far away. I mean, still, the brain is still far more sophisticated than the most sophisticated computer. So the idea of, them, of, of, of biology and humanity merging, I think it's still going to be science fiction for a while. separate that identity yeah. from who you are in like offline and your social media and stuff like that. Right. And technology progresses and we as we see the technology and biology merging, will we see those identities merge as well? What are your Yeah, that, that actually is an excellent question and I, I see where you're going with it. I don't know. I have to think about that. Do we have any thoughts on that, Nadia? Well, we Any anybody know. else? I mean go ahead, yeah. It's from Second Life. People who play Second Life um, they do, when they experience the loss of an avatar, they want to have real life uh, memorial services. Okay. So that are our feelings blending from one world to another, abs it seems to be so. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that when, when you know, and then, and then what, what I'm interested in is, do you get a bereavement day when your avatar dies? <laughs> you know, um, and is that just as valid as losing a person? And I think it brings up a, a whole slew of questions. Interesting. Yeah, good. Very, very provocative question. Other questions? Really? Good. Well, is that great? Yeah, I guess so. All right. Well. Folks, you can all email any of us. If you have questions, you go home and start thinking about things. Give us an email, and we'd be happy to talk more.